So, again, yours truly, we're trying to uh, do things a little bit different. So, um, what happened was I got a new computer because my old one crashed. Before that, we've been doing these Facebook Lives on either my phone or on a tablet. But today, I get to use my new camera, my new computer. My same girl sitting next to me, um, being able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And um, as is mentioned in the title, we are dealing with the word salvation. And this is an exercise that we're going to be doing over the next several weeks, where we're going to be taking one word, and Myra is going to give uh, her impressions and scripture related to that word and i'm going to do the same and at the same time um we're hoping that you all will continue to add words we had three people that have added words and theirs are going to be coming uh after next week uh but next week which is actually resurrection sunday we are going to use another one of our words because it's just appropriate. So while today is salvation, next week will be resurrection because he is risen. And if we're going to acknowledge this time of year for that resurrection, then I think that's the appropriate word. After that, those who have submitted a word to us, we will take them in order of how we receive them. And we had some great words. I know one is reconciliation, the others abide. And there's one other one I can't think of. Deliverance. Deliverance, that's right. And deliverance. So, um, you know, we're excited about that. And it definitely keeps Myra and I in the word of God. So with that said, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Myra to just pray us in. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for every uh, opportunity to share forth the Word of God. May it be an encouragement to some, and may it be a new beginning for others. Whatever you see fit, Father, we know that you have a purpose for our sharing and our lives for each of us according to your purpose. We thank you, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, when you look up salvation, um, you just think about, well, I'm saved. But there's uh, a depth to it that uh, takes on a, a whole new meaning, especially when you you look at what the world says about it and what the word says about it, the world and the word. So I looked it up under Miriam Webster <laughs> and it said preservation or, oh, uh, wait a minute, preservation or process of keeping something valued alive, intact or free from damage or decay. Now, when you think of preservation, it's an activity, it's vigorous, energetic, energetic is action 
and a process is, is ongoing, is going forward, and is proceeding. It's something that's going on. It, it, it never ends. It, it has no ending in sight. And then when you talk about deliverance, that's res liberation or rescue from harm, ruin, or loss. That's what it says in, in the definition from the dictionary. In the theology, it says deliverance from sin and its consequences believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Jesus Christ. Then there's a lot of similarities. The only thing is the biblical definition is Jesus Christ. And that's the standard, that's the beginning, and that's the end. It's that's it. But in, in the world, it's like it has a, a good purpose when you're trying, you know, saving someone. Unfortunately, we were at a uh, memorial yesterday for a, a family member. And it was one gentleman who had been a friend of this person for years. And what struck me in his grief, he was saying, I couldn't save him. I couldn't say that's not his job. <laughs> There's no way he could he could save anyone. Only Jesus Christ can save us. But that's the world. You know, we think that we have some kind of power, but we have no power without him. And you know, this relationship was valuable to him. And he didn't want it to die, decay, or be destroyed. And it's just the nature of life. It's going to happen. But to take on that burden of, I couldn't save him. And it wasn't so much about his salvation because the family had testified that uh, this person had accepted Christ before he passed. But it was like, I couldn't save him from death. But if the family declares that this man has accepted Christ before his passing, then he is saved from death because he has eternal life. So we get caught up in these in this word of like, we're taking more upon ourselves than we have a right to because salvation is based on belief in Jesus Christ. By grace, in Ephesians 2, it says, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, that's the enemy, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the bottom line. But there is, you know, there's a, like the statement that says, we are his workmanship. That should show forth in our lives. Because if we are being ordered and transformed and, and shaped in the image of God, it should be evident in our lives. And that sometimes it does not we don't see that and the world says well you do these good things and you walk in these good things but it's, even in that some people do very good things but they don't really believe in god they believe in themselves i can i am good enough as one entertainer said recently that he was his own god he could make 
things for himself. And I've heard that from people who have professed God and Christ as their savior. And I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it's the, just the idea they're so talented and they're so gifted, not necessarily in the entertainment. This conversation I had with someone was someone who was very smart in the academic field, had been raised as a Christian, had declared Christianity, but went off to college and from the, I don't know, the atmosphere or the, the conversation that was going on in his life, he changed. He felt that he could make decisions for himself, that he had power, that he could direct his life, that he didn't need Jesus. And I was like, oh. And, you know, Jesus is the one that opened up those doors for him. But it was more about him and not about God. And so he was no longer on the the table being formed and transformed like like mm. the potter in the clay allowing the potter to do his work he had moved on and decided i'm going to make my own way i'm going to be who i want to be and that's you know that's very subtle uh way of the enemy because uh, i i was talking to our son today hi dan <laughs> and he was saying he was kind of bored as he's in between some things right now and he didn't have anything to do. And he says, I feel like I'm, I'm slipping. And, you know, first thing came out of my mouth was, you know, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. And that's, that's part of the, the weakness we have in our flesh. Mm. We have to, allow the Lord to keep working on us. If we get off the table, if we get off the potter's table, <laughs> excuse me, and not allow him to continue doing his work in us and through us, we we, we start allowing the flesh, because it's not necessarily the devil, it's our flesh that wants to be in dominion, the flesh that wants to be satisfied, the flesh that is impatient and and wants to go ahead of God when God has his own plan and purpose for our, our lives. John 3 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, there's so many conversations about I'm not ready yet. And, you know, when I get this together, he says he's not come to condemn us. He's opening the door for us to be saved for those who are not saved, that he can do that work. Because we, we want to, you know, put things in order, all our ducks in a row. When the only thing he wants us to do is to believe in him, to repent. Because he says in John 10, I'm the door. One of his many illustrations, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. And there you go. We're back in, <laughs> into the earth, but in a form that is feeding us. Because you think of a pasture where the cows are on and the cows are being fed and then they get fat and then they feed us. But pasture always gives you a picture of a, a peaceful place, a place where we can be filled, we can be replenished. And that's what he says. We can go in and go out and find pasture. So we can be in this world, but we don't have to be of this world. Our salvation should be evident because we have gone through that door because the enemy is always there. He doesn't, he's not there to um, entice us because he wants to, he cares about us. He his his desires is to defame the name of God. He's come to steal, to kill, destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. John 6 35 says, I am the bread of life. And who doesn't love bread? I know we have to watch it when we get to certain levels in our lives because it's not necessarily good. But back in the old days, the bread is not like the bread. The bread was part of the, the normal meal and the, the people were healthy because it was made out of 
out of the earth and the earth wasn't polluted and there weren't pollutants and all these sprays and things. So bread had life in it. But he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Because that is that is life. It's not about having a meal with, you know, caviar and all these uh, extravagant things. Only thing we need is bread and water. And that's the basics to live. And that he says he has that. He has the basics for us to live forever. And in Matthew 4, 17, when Jesus was talking to, he had just left the, the desert and after being tempted by the enemy. And he had heard John the Baptist had been in prison. And he kept going. He kept, he, at that time, he says, from that time after being in the wilderness and hearing that John had been put in jail, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand because he felt, you know, it's important. Now, my job, I'm quoting him, my job is to come to, to bring salvation to a, a unsaved world. Why is it unsaved? Because of Adam and Eve who had that special relationship with God on high. And they were tempted and they fell. And from that point on, it started the disorder in the roles of men and, and, and women. Because from her decision to even listen to the enemy and then to give that over to her husband and then he made the big decision to follow her. That just threw everything off. And from that to generation to generation to generation, there were some that followed. But the majority didn't. And, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures in, in Ezekiel is about how the Jewish people who were chosen by God, you know, the picture was that they were sitting on the side of the road in their own blood as a baby would be. And how he picked them up, washed them off, put clothes on them, put them on the roof, provided what they needed, and they still walked away. So the, even, even in that close relationship, knowing that God was the one that did all that, there was always this, well, I'm still going to do this. I'm still going to do that. But he knew that he needed to send a Savior because as it was evidenced when, when um, Moses went up on the mountain, he was like, Oh, the people said, you go, because there was such a fear of God, but there was not a reverence. It was like, okay, we fear him, you know, like uh, fire and brimstone, but we don't want to have anything to do with him. You deal with him. There wasn't that holy reverence that needed to be, be part of their relationship. Abraham had it. He was, he was a friend of God. He feared him, he, but he obeyed him. But he loved him. All those things are part of the relationship. And even David, you know, he had a heart after God. But it still wasn't enough. And God knew that. And he was willing to give up his own begotten son that he created in a form of a body. So that our limited imagination could reach out and touch that. Where we would say, "Oh no, it's God! I, I don't, I'm, I don't want Him near me. I don't, I'm afraid." But Jesus came to let us know, Emmanuel, God with us, and to to know that He His purpose was to come to die, that we would have life eternal. In Acts two, um, one of Max's favorite scriptures, we are walking through. His death has gone. He's gone. And the, the disciples have gathered and they prayed and the Holy Spirit is coming there. They have just broken out of their timid spirit and they have power because of the Holy Spirit. And they're speaking and they, they're speaking in tongues that, that the others and the language that the others can hear. And it's like a miracle. And all these people from all these different nationalities and, and countries and ethnic groups are there. And they say, now when they heard this, this is what they heard, all this, mm -hmm. this joyous proclaiming 
about Jesus, but in ways they could understand, which was incredible, since these were just lowly Galileans, as they said. But when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift, another gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. We are given so many gifts and the another gift, the Holy Spirit, John 15. Eight says, and when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me. That's the salvation. Believe in Jesus Christ. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. But it's all about believing and repenting and being molded by the greatest potter in this in this uh, universe is because there's this word universe that mm -hmm. drives me crazy because we're not talking about a universe he, he is the cre creator of the universes and his name is God we don't have to say the universe has shown me no God has shown us through his love and a sacrifice of his son, the gift of his death and his resurrection for our sins. And then the other gift, another gift of the Holy Spirit to help us to walk the walk and talk the talk and be those that represent him in such a way that others would come. Because that's the purpose of our lives, that we would be ones that would be jealous of us. So because that we would be ones that others would be jealous of us because of how we demonstrate that they truly know we are Christians by our love. And it's not love that the world talks about. It's the love that God mandates over our lives in the way it should be shown not in the way the world says, but the way God says, because he is a God of the truth. And it's not your truth or their truth, it's his truth. And that's what saves us and enables us and empowers us. Because when we believe and we stand on that, we are truly saved because it's a gift from God. Not that we would boast of it, it's a free gift but it's for the purpose of others to be saved, that they can tell others and that it will be continuously to the time that he comes and he comes to take us to our eternal rest because it says a rest and that the, the those who are in Christ will rise first to judgment and then the others will be risen to judgment. But we don't have to fear because while judgment is based on our relationship and our belief that he truly is the son of God and that we have salvation in his name. Amen. 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 I've never made it a secret uh, that when we're dealing with that word salvation, um, Acts chapter 2 38 is at the forefront of everything that I believe about salvation. You know, sometimes we get in the habit that just because a particular passage doesn't say the word salvation, uh, that it doesn't have any relevance. But in fact, um, if you think about it, with everything going on, on the day of Pentecost and all the things that were happening in the upper room, the exchange of language, mm -hmm. the uh, spirit that was literally like that mighty Russian wind that was just blowing 
in that area. And you have to know that because nothing like that had ever happened before. And that's significant because when we're talking about salvation, there is no salvation without the move of the Holy Spirit. So I'm really flabbergasted and shocked when you even look up uh, scripture references for salvation, because I, I do it periodically, uh, you never see Acts 2 as part of the narrative. But for me, um, I think everything starts there. I mean, the very explosion of what mm -hmm. we now call the church has happened because of what took place in Acts 2, not to mention uh, Acts 1, which set it all up for that occurrence to happen. And, and everything that we're going to talk about on next Sunday, hey, Janae, we see you. God bless you. Um, everything that we're going to talk about on next Sunday, um, it is so relevant to understand this word salvation and to understand the process of everything that's related to it. Now, I'm going to throw two scriptures out today, and, and I call them my combo pack mm -hmm. uh, because these are the two scriptures that I go to every time. And for the record, Romans uh, 10, 9 is not one of them for reasons I won't get into today. But these two passages that I'm getting ready to read in totality, for me, allows for the receiving of the Holy Spirit and the salvation for the Jew. And also when you get to Ephesians chapter two, that also invites this beautiful gift, as Myra has emphasized, to the Gentile. Of course, salvation is for all who believe, but it's just nice to know that you have uh, scriptures that actually show for the Jew and Gentile, excuse me, exactly that everybody is invited to this party. And so I'm going to just go ahead and read uh, Acts 2.38 and Ephesians 2.8-9. through 9. I'm going to be probably reading a lot of passages today um, because I feel like with this one, I need to be a little more academic. Mm. <laughs> so um, in Acts 2.38, all the things I'm reading today uh, are coming out of the King James Version. So Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 states this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, <clears throat> not of works, lest any man should boast. I call it the combo pack because in Acts 2, it lays the groundwork. Now, let me tell you from a historical perspective, there was nothing new about baptism prior to Acts 2. <clears throat> we know that John <clears throat> the Baptist was already doing baptisms uh, prior to the arrival of Jesus Christ in the flesh. We know that <clears throat> part of that baptism process related to repentance and related to the Spirit, but it was not complete. 
And what made the baptism that's being talked about in Acts 2 much different than what John was doing is because of the name in which it was being done. It is very uh, critical to understand that to say that name, remember, remember in that upper room, there were Jews in that upper room. The remember, the Jews were the ones who ordered the hit on Christ. And we can't get around that. And we don't just blame one cultural group, but historically that's how it went down. But we know that for the record, it's the nature of man that put Christ on the cross. So it could have been any culture, but this is significant. So they, you know, send him off to Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate. We, we, we know all the exchanges and we know that Pontius Pilate just rid his hands of the whole mess, especially after the wife, his wife comes and says, I had a dream about this and it was a bad look. And so here they go. So we we understand the process. We know that it was Barabbas that the people uh, decided to be released from the penalty of his uh, wrongdoing. And it was the Christ, the innocent lamb who was uh, slain for our sin, who was the propitiation of sin for us. So that is the setting that we have uh, going into Acts 2, that this gift, this beautiful, wonderful gift that Christ himself had promised, you know, when he told them as he was getting ready to ascend into heaven to be with his father. And as it says, you know, in scripture that to prepare a place for us, his promise was that he would not leave us without comfort and that there would be a comforter that would come. And this comforter would be the one who would lead and guide us unto all truth. So this is the, the setup. And why I love Acts 2.38 so much is that for the unbeliever, who is now coming into the understanding that they need a savior. And honestly, guys, most of us understand prior to our conversion, we need something. Now, we might not know who it is or what it is, but all of us are always searching for why we're here, what is our purpose, and what is it we're supposed to do? So these are, are just internal questions that you may not hear people verbalize all the time, but it's so relevant in understanding the nature of people. So when you're like myself or Myra, and you're actually witnessing the folks, we never look at it as if somehow we don't understand the plight that they're going through, because we too were once yet sinners. And we also had rejected Jesus Christ. And we had to come into the knowledge of him who came to save us and make us free and deliver us from evil. And so this is the, the setting which makes it so exciting for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to break it all down in a moment. Um, but then when we get over into Ephesians uh, 2, verses 8 and 9, to know that it is nothing that we can do, Janae, on hell. There's nothing that we can do to actually get this salvation because it's a gift. It's a gift that God has determined. In fact, God knew that he was giving this gift well before you were formed in the bellies of your mothers. Yet God knew that one day this precious gift would have to be bestowed upon you. And even knowing that this gift was needed, which this whole gift 
signifies the, the fact that God knew even when he made man, that man would fall short of the glory. He knew it. If, if, if you say anything different, then you don't understand the nature of God. If God knows everything, is everything, is everywhere, all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty, then we have to know there are no surprises in the kingdom of God. And when we're talking about these things, we need to be open and real enough within ourselves to understand we will always be the creation and we will never be able to absurd or outthink the creator. And so when you put those things into perspective and understand that this beautiful salvation comes to us as a gift from God, not based upon the fact that you didn't smoke today, <laughs> not based upon the fact that you didn't curse today. I just love it when people come up to me and say, man, I ain't had a drink in three years, <laughs> as if that's a qualifier for anything that's holy. I'd be more impressed if you said, man, I've been in sackcloth and ashes for years, you know, in my worship of the Lord, understanding that I'm filthy, I'm a filthy rag. Now you would impress me. But these natural things that we think that we're giving up for the sake of the kingdom, that's not really how it works. Yes, do we finally release ourselves from this evil flesh that we dwell in in order to experience Christ in the way that he's always wanted us to? Absolutely. However, these things only come by the grace of God. There's nothing that we can do to brag about this thing. You know, we can give our testimonies. We can say that, uh, you know, we're more than conquerors, but that's not a brag for us. That's a brag to God, that God is the one who made us more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. It is God who actually represents the finished work that's the cross that that is all the implica uh, implications or uh, implications, excuse me, that come by way of the cross. The cross in and of itself is not the deity, but knowing that the deity had to be crucified on that wood in order for us to understand on that third day, he would rise with all power in heaven and in earth. And with that power, he would then bestow that power in each and every one of us so that his Holy Spirit no longer had to just rest upon us like it did in the old covenant, but now would wants to dwell inside of us. So when we are reading Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is the most humbling statement to say that I had nothing to do with this. This is a gift that God has given. And the only requirement that we truly brought to the table is faith. But even that faith that we bring to the table is only uh, recognized because God has given us a track record from the time of Genesis to the time of Revelation, we have a historical, spiritual, social, mental, physical even account of who God is, how Christ fits into this picture, and who we are, who we were, who we can become. All of it is spoken about in the Bible. And so what I want to do is I get ready to wrap up my portion of all of this is to now take each one of these verses, break them down, because as much as I've used them, I never really took the time to just truly break it down and understand 
exactly what's being said. So starting with Acts 2, 38, I'm just going to throw out key words within that verse. Most of the time, those key words, you will know them because they are verbs. Because verbs represent actions that are happening. Now, I toss in a few nouns and, you know, I've got the I've got the English scholar right here. I, I don't know. I, I don't I couldn't tell you what a preposition is. I couldn't tell you what a dangling participle is either. But I can tell you about the things, the key words that help us unlock the passages. And for those of you that are looking to deepen your understanding of the scriptures, I would challenge you to just take one of your favorite scriptures, pull out the words that are most necessary in them mm -hmm. and determine what they mean. And I'm going to tell you, your mind will be automatically blown because if you all think that either myself or Myra are coming with any kind of superior intellect, I can tell you not at all, but, but just slow reading through the passages, trying to understand what God is saying. I see you, Susan. God bless you. Um, this is everything that we're doing. We're not trying to intellectualize this stuff. We're trying to understand why God allowed these words in the book. So the first word, we're, we're in Acts uh, chapter 238. I'm, I'm not going to talk about any other uh, scriptures, although I'm going to use some other scriptures to back these things up. So the first word that pops out is repent. <laughs> <laughs> and listen to this, repent, changing of the inner man, accepting this change according to the will of of God, a changing of the mind based on one's conviction through the Holy Spirit. See, repentance is not just about, okay, I'm just going to not do that sin anymore and, 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 and you know, my promise, I'm not going to do it again. It is a literal, what, what does Romans uh, 12 say? You know, a transforming of your mind, a renewing of your mind to do what? To show what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. There has to be a total mind transformation. That's what repentance is. And that transformation is solely directed according to God's will, not our will. We want to do good, but it's God's will that matters. So whatever God's will is, is what we're supposed to be compliant with when we accept that we were sinners and now that we are coming into a place where we acknowledge our transgressions that other sinners may be converted unto him through our testimony. Little Psalm 51. Okay, when we understand that, then we can look at this word and say, wow, imagine this. The one thing that, remember, we're dealing with a Jewish audience, even here in that upper room. And so when Peter, of all people, the one who denied Jesus Christ three times before the cock crow, this same one is the one saying, repent. And he is saying, just as I have, now I need you, brethren, to do the same thing. Turn away from everything that you thought you understood, and you need to open up your mind and heart to receive this new thing, new to them, mm -hmm. this new thing, this spirit that literally came in and just blew the house down. This is what you need to recognize. This is the power of God manifested invisibly in this room that we occupy. And so we 
today, we don't just say, oh, I repent of my sin. Mm -hmm. And then we just going back down to the corner and have our fifth and do our cussing and busting and, and do all these things that originally separated us from God to begin with. We can't do that any longer. I, I've told you guys on many occasions, I had given my life to Christ or at least I called myself giving my life to Christ, but I, I wanted to get one more in, one more in, went to a bar and tried to get drunk. I tried, I drank it all down and could not get high. And that was when, even though I made my profession, but when I did that and I could not get drunk, I knew that it had changed. And, and I'm not saying that alcohol in and of itself was the only issue that I was dealing with, but that is how I medicated my sin through alcohol. And when I couldn't get drunk, I knew God had changed me. And it's never been the same ever since. So I don't mind telling my story. So then the other key thing, we talk about repent, but then it says, be baptized. Ah, baptized. Listen to this. What is that? A ceremonial submergence. Y'all, for y'all that don't understand that word, to be going under, okay, with the intent of cleansing unrighteousness and replacing that unrighteousness with righteousness, to be purified, sanctified to be identified with the death of Christ and his resurrection, being crucified from one's flesh, to be, to mortify the deeds of this flesh and know that we can now be risen with him in newness of life. And just for the record, for those of you that do not understand this, as much as we celebrate on next uh, Sunday, we'll celebrate Resurrection Sunday. I refuse to call it that E-word because uh, that's pagan. Sorry, guys, I won't do it. Uh, and I'm dropping my Bible. Nevertheless, on next Sunday, as much as we celebrate the victory that he rose, we also want to line that up because he rose. We too can rise in him. He's the one with the power. He's the one who has the dominion. And through him, as the Bible says, we can do all things because he strengthens us. Let's read this in Romans 6, uh, 3 through 11. <clears throat> Love this. It says, know ye not <clears throat> that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you go under that submergent, submergence, that's the, the literal death of our flesh. All right? That like as Christ was raised up when we come up from that water, raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We don't get dumped to just say, oh, it was a nice little cleansing ritual, <laughs> and now we just going to act the same way we've been acting all the time. No, no. There is supposed to be a dedication, a renewal, a cleansing, of an, an acknowledgement that we were dirty. Dirty beyond dirt. You understand what I'm saying? This is a dirt you can't wash with soap. This is a cleansing of the spirit. Water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And we cleanse in that water and we come up out of that water renewed in life. So anyway, it says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We're walking around in the likeness 
of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Mm -hmm. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Every time I try to tell you, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, that's all that's being said here. If you are dead to your flesh, sin is dead in you. All right. So now it says, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. So y'all stop putting him back on this cross. He did it once and he did it for good. We need to recognize that. We need to understand that the sins that he died for are the sins of people that we will never know because they will be here on this earth long after we depart. That's how incredible what he did on that cross is, and, and the, the, the weight of sin that he borne, it was for the generations that had not even come into play, even now. And so when we take that into account, again, as I've said many times, I will not walk around and call myself this nasty name called sinner. I have sinned, absolutely, but I am not a sinner. I'm saved by his grace. And in that grace, will I make mistakes? Yes, but he covered them so that I do not willfully sin to disrespect my Lord. If it happens, he already knew it happened and he has paid the price for that. And for me, it's a learning curve to understand how far I'm still away from him. I don't know if I can explain that any better. Lastly, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm going to marry that with Luke 3, 16 says this, John answered, saying unto them, all, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and what? And with fire. 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 Fire baptized. All right. So this is the whole difference. J John the Baptist was explaining, man. My my thing I'm doing here is partial because mm -hmm. the one is coming that has more power than me. I'm not worthy to even tie his shoelaces. I'm not worthy probably to even share this water. Yet God has given me the privilege to be the one to baptize him that you, oh God, might cry out from heavenly this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so, guys, when we, when we read these passages, we must, must break them down so that we get a clear understanding of what God is saying to us because these things are powerful. Let me not be too long-winded here. So then the next thing is forgiveness of sin. God forgives our crimes against him. Did you know that that's what sin is? It is a crime against God. And we need to call it that. It's not just being bad. It's a crime. It's a violation of God. All right? And it places the burden 
of our indiscretions on Jesus Christ. Then it says, ye shall receive. I'm just pulling up the key parts of Acts 2, 38. To actively lay hold of or to take. To aggressively be accepting of the things that are being offered. And what is being offered is a renewed life in Christ. And that's why we should pursue the throne with everything that's within us. It's like in those movies. You know how you have a chase scene and you know that there's something that's up ahead that you've got to get and you darn near knock down everybody to get to it. It's that kind of aggressive. I'm not telling you guys to go out and knock people down. I'm saying it's with that attitude. What we should be knocking down are all the indiscretions of our lives so that we are pursuing him directly and he will recognize you and he will bless you for that kind of commitment to him. And then lastly for Acts 2.38, what do we receive? We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this gift is God's granting of his spirit as a gift to people that repent and become baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And I'm going to go here. This is one I had marked. This is important, but I'm going to uh, Joel chapter 2, 28. Uh, through 32. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Didn't say just for the Jews, even though we're still in the old covenant, to all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So we don't want to exclude the ladies here Ladies, you have a purpose, all right? Just understand what that purpose is. And so you have this ability to prophesy in today's language. That just means to declare the word of God in the appropriate way. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Do you see? This is proclaiming things that haven't even happened in our time yet. Okay. So we're living still in the promise of this prophecy. All right. And so then it lastly says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So again, remember, Joel is writing to a Jewish audience. So that's why we're talking about Jerusalem and Zion. And we're talking about this remnant. And those would be the Jews who would later on come to accept Christ as Savior. What we would call, what do we call them today? Um, Messi Messi Messianic Jews. That's right. Messianic Jews. This is them that they're talking about. And they shall too also call on the name of the Lord. And this is key because for the Jew to call on the name of the Lord ostracizes them from their families, their brethren as well. So that's the breakdown of Acts 2.38. And I'm going to quickly go through Ephesians 2. Verses eight through nine, it's not as much as you think. 
Um, so again, just to put that verse back into the atmosphere, it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and not that of yourselves. Mm -hmm. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so into this, we are now in a place in the new covenant. And now it is the apostle Paul that is talking about these same things, all right? And what is being said here, again, I'm just pulling out the key words or words that help make this come alive. So the first thing we got to start for by grace. What is that? It's the unmerited, undeserved favor. And let me put favor of God wrapped in a sacred bow and given to the believer by Christ. That's my definition, all right? I don't want y'all to know, I, this is my definition because this is how I receive this stuff. So I'm going to go to Romans 5, uh, verses 20 and 21. Romans 5, 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, listen to this, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's heavy. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, it's just saying that the sin nature is unto death, but the grace can be of an abundance that overcomes all of this sin. And we need to recognize that and that when we allow sin to die, then by grace, we get to spend eternity in righteousness with him who came to save us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm also going to um, say that <clears throat> that unmerited favor is not something that we should take advantage of or assume that it's just going to always be there. Each and every day, we should wake up with the humility of knowing that we are still yet the filthy rag. It's only because God says that we are royal priesthood. It's only because of that that we're able to live in the righteousness of Christ and we are dwelling by the power of his Holy Spirit. We don't ever want to neglect that or take advantage of that either. So then quickly, it then says, ye are saved. Uh, you know, what is that? What is that? Being saved. <laughs> it's, um, it's God's rescue plan for anyone uh, from the power and penalty of sin. Satan had us, sin had us through penalty and through power because they, you know, sin has power. And there's a penalty for it. But God rescues us from that. That's the gift, y'all. Okay, he rescues us from the penalty and the power of sin into his provisions through Christ to be rescued out of danger into the safety of Christ. When John would write, you know, from a perspective of the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple who would lay his head in Jesus' mm -hmm. bosom. That's not a thing of being mm -hmm. weak or, 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 or being queer or homosexual. That's a place of understanding your comfort zone, where that comfort is coming from. It, you know, it's, it's amazing, guys, because I know I'm speaking mostly to a U.S. audience, but since Angel is on mm -hmm. here, with us now, 
one of the most beautiful things that he does, and I should acknowledge it more, is that when he comes to say goodnight to me, <laughs> or sometimes when he just greets me, he literally lays his head <laughs> upon my shoulder. <laughs> and this is not an act of weakness. This is an act of reverence. And that's how we should be in our relationship with our Lord. Male, female, this is the one time it's all right. You can do this. <laughs> this is what it's all about. Lay your head in his bosom from a, a spiritual perspective. And if we ever get that opportunity from a natural perspective, <laughs> there's no shame in this game. All right. So then I'm going to pull out the scripture from Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter one, and we're going to be dealing with verse uh, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, mm -hmm. the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit mm -hmm. of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance mm -hmm. unto redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Man, you guys ought to be doing a shout of praise right now. I mean, these words are so passionate of how much God loves us. We think that somehow God has separated himself uh, from us when we go through challenges. But it's really God's way of saying is that, baby, I need you to, to really feel as much as you can withstand of what Jesus Christ felt, because then you'll understand my love for you. And that that is a hard lesson to learn. And many times, we want the agony to end. We want the suffering to end. We want the hardships to end. But I stopped asking for those things to end because what I've done instead is to say that, may I see your glory through my struggle and also understanding my struggle will never be your struggle. And when you put it into that perspective, it does make things a little easier. And once we understand we're saved through faith, what is that? Well, we know Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But here's my definition that says to be divinely persuaded by God, trusting and believing God's track record. Guys, the Bible is God's track record. And knowing he can do all things according to his will. If he hasn't done it, it's not his will to do it. That's really it. Uh, honestly, I've been waiting for something to happen uh, for me and others uh, based upon the ministry work that I do. I've been waiting for about a year and a half, and every day, I'm just like, oh. you know how they sing, you know, don't mind waiting, don't mind waiting? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. Sometimes I've minded waiting. <laughs> but I've come to understand that <laughs> what is it? The trying of one's faith worketh patience. patience. So we're going to let patience and experience and hope, we're going to let them all do their perfect work because that's according to his will, all right? And so um, everything that I've dedicated my life to now is about being in his will. I don't have to understand God. I stopped trying a long time ago. I wanna focus more now in my own personal walk with him on living in obedience to him. And so, yes, does that mean I say things that hurt people's feelings? Yes. I think I probably did it yesterday. Yes. But <laughs> for the greater good of the kingdom, I will continue to do that because that is my call and, and the purpose that God has revealed to me. 
uh, for my life, but according to his will. Uh, so then we're almost done. Uh, this faith is not of anything that we do, not of our works. And these things that we call works are those things that are accomplished in spite of uh, our human actions. When we say not of our works, these things are supernatural. I can, I can lift Myra's glass of water right now. Totally, I mean, I guess, you know, in theory, everything we do is God's power doing it. But there's little to no effort for me to do this. But when it comes to the things that are of a weightier nat uh, nature, things that could only be God-inspired, I can't do it. I can't save myself. I can't anoint myself. I can't appoint myself. That's why I'm always wondering why people are going around self-anointing and appointing themselves and calling mm -hmm. themselves things that they can't be because God didn't say it. I'm not going to call any names, but y'all know what I'm talking about. We got all these people that are professing to be things, and God didn't say it. Man has said it, but not God. Why isn't it we can't just be satisfied to be servants and just be done with it? Who cares what my title is? I actually have one, but I don't talk about it because it's not necessary. It doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of the things I'm sharing with you now. I don't need to have a doctorate to share what I'm sharing with you now, although I have no problem with people that do. I'm just saying that we have to come to the understanding that it's God who's our teacher. It is God who gives us the qualifications on what we can share and cannot share. And it's God who allows us to do any of the works that we do do. And we know that, um, you know, Faith without works is dead. I know that y'all are going to pull that on me. But the problem is, is most people are operating in works only and haven't exercised faith. And so they're out of order. And if you think that you're doing anything just because you go to the church every Wednesday night to set it up because you uh, are the first one at the door on Sunday morning because you oversee five zillion uh, uh, ministries within your particular house of worship, if you think that that is the call, then you're still sadly forsaken and mistaken because that's that's not what this is. This is about understanding what our purpose is. And just like Christ in Luke 19, 10, as he is the one who seeks and saves that which was lost, was lost, we too should take on that same banner that same manner and say, I too, for the sake of Christ, go out to seek and to save that which was lost. By the way, that's one of my favorite passages too. So lastly, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, 13 through 15. Um, this one I wanted to make sure I marked. Uh, so very quickly, it says this. I actually started at verse 12. Because it's important to understand how he starts this. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So this is a man of stature. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit, lower S, lowercase s. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. This is a man who they say was the wisest man to ever walk the earth. Yet, he had to have his own coming to Jesus moment, even though we're still in the old covenant. But he had to come to the realization that, man, he's walking out of order. And 
We think that those things that we are doing is glorifying God, but oftentimes, oftentimes, God wants you to actually be still and listen to him for a while. You don't have to always be busy. Being busy does not equate to holiness. What equates to holiness is being self-sacrificial, dying to our wants, and putting his wants above anything that we want. Then we can actually have a good conversation. And then lastly, so that we don't boast, that comes to being arrogant and proud to take credit for accomplishments that should be attributed to Christ, which are a lot of testimony services oftentimes in our places of worship. Um, so I'm going to end that there. But to just to kind of summarize this word salvation, I did it in this combo pack because if you took any of the lessons that Myra shared previous and that I've just shared right now, then, man, it gives you a wonderful blueprint on truly understanding what salvation is, what salvation is not. And as long, J Janae, as long as you understand, and Angel, as long as y'all understand, Susan, if you're still there, as long as you understand that this is nothing that we can do. Remember, what's it in John 15, I believe? He, he chooses us. We don't choose him. So he chooses us by way of this gift. And when we are humble enough to receive the gift, then your world opens up and it becomes a beautiful place to live, even in the midst of all this negativity, mm -hmm. but more so to have fellowship with the one who made you and the one who redeemed you, and the one who makes sure that you're always walking in truth, then, guys, you're going to just shout and rejoice the victory because you will have it in Christ. Um, I promise next Sunday, I know what I need to do now so that we actually get started on time. Um, hope you like this new format. I hope we get more people engaged. I know that the next couple of weeks, because today's Palm Sunday, which I failed to acknowledge in our opening, um, but happy Palm Sunday to everyone. And then next week's uh, Resurrection Sunday. Um, I understand if our numbers are down a little bit, but the beautiful thing about all this is that you can always check us out later. And please, 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 feel free to give us your comments. Uh, as long as they're constructive, good or bad, um, we're, we're good with it. And because uh, we want to be better. And I know you guys want to be better too. With that said, may God bless you and keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless. Fire, fire. In sin I was, come see one day. So childish in my, so lost in my ways. I spent my time believing what the serpent said. Then my eyes were open when the Lord Jesus came And sin is just a waste of time And even as just blows my mind I tell you, and everyone will know the crime